What's up, everybody? This is Posh. We're on the Founder Hour podcast. I'm Pat. And we're here today with two amazing ladies, Melissa Palmer and her mother, Jennifer Palmer, who are the founders and leaders of Osea. Uh, so we're very glad to have you guys on the show today. Hello. We're so happy to be here. And just for the record, that's Melissa. And Melissa, we'll start, kind of start off with you and then we'll pass it on to mom to talk about then her Then we'll go vision. to where... The originator of everything, including exactly, myself. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> including myself. The founder yeah. of My Melissa. My personal founder. The, the founder, founder of Osea <laughs> and Melissa Palmer. Yeah. There you go. There you go. This is like founder uh, inception. inception. Found- yeah. Founder inception. <laughs> founders within founder. founders. <laughs> no, I'm the big dog founder. There, <laughs> there you go. There, you guys heard it here first, the big dog founder. Um, <laughs> Melissa, let's start it off in the early days. I know obviously your mom's here, so we'll also ask her a little bit about her um, early days, but talk to us about what young Melissa was like. And then I'm going to ask your mom the same question. Cause I'm sure she'll have a different perspective. Well, actually now I regret doing this with my mom too. Cause <laughs> I like my own version of young Melissa. Okay. Young Melissa was, um, definitely very bossy. Um, but I was lucky enough to be trained or I'm sure my mom really did have a plan, but I like to think it was my true spirit to be a total entrepreneur. Um, I had a paper route. I babysat. I had a paper route that I got a lot of people to help with my paper route. Is this in LA, by the way? Where are we based? Well, okay. Super far back. We actually originally grew up on a commune off the the coast of Washington. And then we grew up in LA. Got it. So I would say... Young Melissa was pretty entrepreneurial. Okay. And you own this paper route? This is your paper route? Yeah, <laughs> multiple paper what, routes. What inspired you to start the paper route? Well, what inspired me to start the paper route was summer camp. Mm. I went to summer camp for eight weeks one year, and it was literally the most fun I'd ever had. And it also happened to cost like $7,000 at the time. So I was given the choice to go back. I got to pay for half of it. So mm. it really instilled the value of what hard work and like the fun that hard work could buy. Right. And, and what do you think kind of just delving deeper into that? I mean, what do you think that that shows or what do you think people that are even, you know, in their twenties and thirties could gain from that? Right. The, the fact that you wanted something and you worked to make money to actually get it as opposed to just saying, eh, well, maybe I won't go this year. Well, like, how did that talk to us about that motivation process that was, or the internalization. And you didn't just work. Process. You could have gone in a job somewhere, but like you started your own paper out, which is like uh, there's, a, there's a risk factor there too. So <laughs> mother, mom, wants to, mom wants to jump in. Well, I what was mean, it really like? She was like 11 years old. So they weren't hiring at the mall in her age category. Mm, mm. Um, so, I mean, she was driven by the motivation. And I mean, she made bank on that paper route. I yeah. was impressed. <laughs> I had multiple routes, and I contracted out assistants on parts of the job. Wow. At 11? Um, I, yeah. Wow. <laughs> to the nine-year-olds. Well, Come think on, Pat. I what it really cultivated in me, and since my mom's right here, I can credit her with this, it really helped cultivate the part of me that appreciates hard work. And, like, I love a win, when I know I've worked for it. Mm. And that, I th- that was just part of ongoing lessons of like, actually, you have, I, you have to work really hard and then you can thrive. But was there like anyone it's, in your and family? Also, or, I think work is fun. Yeah. So that's probably the other part. Um, was there anyone in your family? I don't know if you were, um, but like that, that was entrepreneurial that had their own business where you kind of saw that where you're like, you know, it's, I want to, I could start my no own There was no one thing. in my family who wasn't. Oh, okay. Hmm. So. So you, I never yeah. grew up with parents that like left the house at 8 a.m. to go to a job and came home at 6. And this is it was I mean, we were on a ride. And mm-hmm. I think that was so that's how I, that was my interpretation of things. Yeah. <laughs> ex- ex- explain us like what the home life was like, like what was what was your family like? <laughs> <laughs> you guys are both laughing. Like, can't I wait for the answer. We're like, oh, we're here for family therapy. Who knew? Yeah. <laughs> um, I think. It was just like a constant adventure. My parents had a real estate company. They, my mom, you know, really Osea was a really continuous thread through Mm -hmm. that life because my brother was also, I have a younger brother who had, 
he was running a Beanie Baby and Krispy Kreme business. Um, he was like selling snacks at school. He had a whole deal yeah. with Beanie Babies. Like he'd get them in advance and then he'd go sell them around. So we were just all like constantly trying mm. fun things. And um, meanwhile, like we always had like a bathtub full of seaweed. There was all these like weird tinctures and concoctions. And my mom was really leading the way because for a lot of our childhood, she was a single mom completely supporting us and never. So a lot of our entrepreneurship was out of necessity yeah. in terms of like, hey, I want you to have these great things and you're going to contribute and work for them too. Right. But it was always really fun. Um but it was just it was just a constant threat of our family. And Jennifer, yeah. I'm curious, where did you know, for you obviously Melissa talked about it coming from necessity, but in terms of whether you know, for the seaweed, for example, like where does that stem from? You know, what what was your vision of that or how did you even get into that? Well, that's actually it kind of sounds like a simple, easy question, but it has a really fascinating story. Well, I can't wait to hear it. Um, my grandmother was, if not the first woman chiropractor, one of the very first two or three. She graduated actually 100 years ago this year from wow. chiropractic school. In Washington or? No, no, no. In Davenport, Iowa, the only chiropractic school in the world. Wow. wow. And um, she had literally come to the U.S. when she was 16 years old. Her parents just bought her a ticket and said, we can't feed you anymore. By the way, your brother came 10 years earlier, hmm. see if you can find them. And where were they coming from? Germany. Okay. So, I mean, she had to come to a new country, learn the language, eventually found her brother, fell in love with a fellow German immigrant, raised five children, felt like a chiropractor had healed one of her children, so her response was, I need to go to chiropractic school. Did that, came back, had another baby, and then one day she had some kind of accident, hurt herself, got worse and worse and was ended up flat on her back hmm. for a few months and literally had a dream one night. I know it sounds so funny because yeah. I've told this so many times, yeah. but she had this dream that this ocean and seaweed would heal her. So she was a bossy little thing, very much like her great granddaughter. And um, that's <laughs> not mentioning any names, yeah. wink, wink. She just and, happens to be in the room, maybe, maybe. But not. maybe she's near me, maybe she's <laughs> yeah, not. Yeah, I'm not yeah. sure. Yeah. So my grandmother kind of looked at her and said, okay. And it was, you know, January in um, Bayside, New York. And put her in the sound, and it was cold, and there was seaweed on the beach. And, and around she, what year was this? Sorry? Um, oh. This was probably in the 30s. 1930s. And um, they, he brought her back every day. She started getting better really rapidly. They ended up starting pretty much one of the first. If I mean, how many of the first? I mean, how many people had, did any of your grandparents have polar bear clubs that they started and they cut no. through ice to swim no, in the water. That no, was not. kind of an offbeat thing. Yeah. So it was always, every. I always like to say every family has a mythology. Right. And no one actually thinks their family's mythology is mythology. They view it as reality. Right. And so I always knew that the ocean and seaweed was healing. Huh. I just always knew that. And boy... I never like to go visit my grandparents in November because they try to drag me in the water. Hmm. And we actually have some pictures, I think, on our website. And it kind of looks, it's black and white. You know, they put it in the newspaper on New Year's Day every year where it looks like she's standing, they're standing on sand. But nope, that's snow. Huh. So, mm. And around that time, like, I guess, that was there anything out there that was related to seaweed? Like when it came to like... He, it was just something that your family kind of stumbled upon, and she had a dream. She also had a dream the night the Titanic sank that the that the Titanic sank and woke up hysterical. And my grandfather almost wanted to get her put in a straitjacket. Oh so whenever God. my grandmother said, "I had a dream," with her, you know, accent, everyone was like, "Oh, uh -oh. <laughs> oh it's not about me." God. So yeah, wow. So Talk about so an actual visionary. It was just she was really a visionary. Yeah, and. Um, you know, and in terms of being a parent, kind of going back to what Melissa was saying, I think to me the art of parenthood was I really guided my children very strongly, but I always did my best to make it look like 
they thought of it. Mm. <laughs> and it's so that's great. What every, that's what every good leader does, right? Yeah. I mean, if that's a good idea, you credit them. If it's yeah. a bad one, you take the blame for it. Yeah. Well, and, and they really think that all these things and directions they did in their life, they thought of and they own it and they love it. And there you have it. My uh, secret. I'm curious, I'm curious though, like um, going back to your grandparents, like what, did they ever end up starting a business when it came to like... Well, my grandmother so- had a full chiropractic business and okay. my grandfather was a New York City policeman. Mm-hmm. And then, and then have- she would have people come fast at her house in the 30s. She was doing iridology. Mm-hmm. I mean, during the Great Depression, they always had food because everyone traded with them and they had beautiful antiques that people would give my grandmother so she could continue to mm-hmm. treat them. And I mean, it's kind of amazing to think she was having people come stay at the house for two weeks and doing juice fasts. Wow. Wow. And it was like 80 years ago. 90 yeah, years ago. yeah. 80. Yeah. And then, so what did your parents do? Well, then my mother was the youngest child of so, I mean, she, my grandmother didn't even know she was pregnant until my mother kicked her. And uh, so my mother ended up working in advertising and married my father, who she fell in love with in high school. And then my dad was a, a you know, a corporate executive and my mom uh, raised me. But I always had, but my mom always had a different lens. Mm. I mean, we had the non-hydrogenated peanut butter. And keep in mind, I'm turning 65 Two more months, Medicare, but <laughs> that's music to my ears. Yeah. Universal health care has oh, arrived yeah. for me. But um, so, I mean, I grew up with a healthy perspective. Yeah. I mean, I've never eaten bologna in my entire life. I mean, I don't know if you're missing out on bologna. I don't think I am. Yeah. I think I'm good with that. Yeah, you're yeah. good with that. Yeah, I don't even eat the vegan bologna. I just really like, I think I'm going to live this life without it. So you've been vegan your entire life? No, no. But I mean, you know, there's certain, I was saying, I would just never even eat vegan mm-hmm, bologna. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So. I love that. Melissa, kind of turning it over to you, I know you said that, you know, you were 11 years old doing this, and I'm sure from 11 to high school, there was a lot of other stuff that you were working on. But you mentioned, perhaps even, it might have been off the podcast, that Osea was built, Osea, sorry, was built um, while you were in high school, right? Or or the inception of it was during your high school years? I would say it actually went well before that. Okay. My mom had a healing practice. She was a cranial, did cranial sacral work, and while she was raising us, was continually formulating and reformulating. So we really grew up with, I mean, it goes much further back than that probably, mm, like, yeah. Junior high or elementary school. I mean, it was just a constant. Right. Essential oils and seaweed were the mainstays yeah. of our home. Yeah. So, um, but I guess like at the time, it, it, it was part of your life, but did you see it as like a business opportunity at that age? Or was it more so, this is just who I am. This is what I'm raised around. Right at the end of high school is when I really like saw my mom had gotten like the brand, there had been many iterations of the brand. And that was the moment when I, who knows, now that I'm hearing this, that my mom really had all the ideas. Yeah. I thought it was my idea. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's all here. my entire world is crumbling Everything. before my eyes. That's what we like to do. Here. I allegedly had the great idea that I was so into like business and I'd at already been like running our family financials Mm -hmm. and like I did all like the organization and bill pay and that was like part of my jobs I took on in the family um I started yeah so I started to expand that into the business and that was really when my mom and I became a team but but what was it what was the product what 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 was the early days of what you guys were selling this is what I think makes OCS so incredibly unique it was the same thing Hmm. we have been for decades now, selling the same thing. And what makes it so specifically unique is that it's so relevant and current right now. But we had less products in the line, but our first product was a product called Essential Hydrating Oil, which is one of our best sellers today. But it was a really weird and fringe product in the 90s. No one was using facial oils. So much work to explain to someone to hydrate their skin right. with an oil. Especially this back may then, be news yeah. to you guys, but people love oils on their face. Yeah. So, um, but that, that I know. That yeah. I know. <laughs> 
1983, that product was my mom first came up with that idea. Well, I guess let's ask mom, like 1983, what, how did you come about that product or idea? Like where did that, I get that, you know, seaweed went back years for the family, but how did you even get into the oils? And I, I know you said that was part of your practice, but is that something that you manufactured, developed yourself? Well, I, w- I was a spa director in starting in 1981, which um, was kind of funny because I'd never been inside a spa before. Mm. But, you know, not really any, no one else in the United States had been either, pretty much. And I had a very strong healing arts background from the, my history of my grandmother. And from that's the kind of work I'd been doing one-on-one. So I ended up at this place called Murrieta Hot Springs. And it was an old spa building with 36 private mineral tubs, three outdoor mineral baths, two mud bath houses, one for men, one for women, and an Olympic pool designed by Julia Morgan, who did the Hearst Castle. And it mm-hmm. was just like, wow, what is this place? And yeah. it was empty. And there, I saw my first bat that I'd ever seen in my mm-hmm. life before. It turns out there was a lot of them living in the spa. And um, so... We just started kind of renovating it, and it was, you know, it was part of a hotel. And I just looked at this building and thought, well, I guess I need to make up stuff for people to do in here. Yeah. So I just started making up treatments and ideas. And, and, and one of my first ones was called a skin glow rub. And we would, before, or no, first people would soak in, no, first people would soak in the mineral bath. Oh, I know sauna then we would um their skin would be really warm and Mm. moist they'd take a warm shower then we would scrub them with salt and dr bronner's soap and then they would rinse off go into the hot mineral bath and then end up in the cold tub with little bubbleator jets and everybody loved it and it was so ironic it never occurred to me to make a product you know the famous salt scrub Mm -hmm. which origins ended up launching and doing maybe 10 years after that you know in maybe the late 80s or something and but meanwhile i was kind of formulating basic essential oils things like that just to be used in treatments And I wanted to do something with a synergy with essential oils and botanicals. So it was kind of coming from need. I'd go to little India and buy Ayurvedic herbs and make them into a paste and mud. And then we'd paint people's bodies with them. Mm -hmm. It was was really fun. It was my own playground. But you weren't trying to necessarily build a business out of that? Oh, no. We were charging for spa services at the hotel. Right. I'm saying for the product. Yeah, I wasn't trying to build a product line. Right. I was just creating experiences. Were there other product lines like existing at that time? Like hardly being sold in anything. Stores? Hardly really? anything. Aveda was just getting going. I mean, it was pretty dry out there. Yeah, yeah and 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 it actually, in like in the early '80s, all the books on essential oils were written in French. But mm. luckily, I'd been raised partly in Switzerland, so wow. I could read those books. That's awesome. Yeah, Melissa, I know you. You guys started this company in 1996, right? That is our official launch date. Official launch date, right. At what point before 96 did you two agree, okay, we should probably start selling this? It was sold in a lot of different variations. Um, While we were living in Malibu, people were buying like jars with handmade labels. And the goal was always... So part of the real moment when the products came about and when my mom knew she was onto something is while looking for brands to use at the spa. There were so few natural brands and she always looked at products that you use on your skin just in the way she taught us Mm -hmm. to look at food, which is you read the label first. So after seeing the success, once the spa um, closed down, seeing the success and following for the products, that was really the impetus for like, okay, we're on to something. And then the formulation really began of like, how can we make a brand? And and before we get into that part, um, going back to like when you were in high school, uh, like any kid in high school, like there comes a time when you have to figure out what do you want to do next? Like, do you want to go to college? What are you going to learn? Like, what are you going to study? Um, was that in the plans for you? And did you have anything else if, for, if this didn't end up becoming like a business? You're, you're smiling, so. Well, I did it? go to college. Yeah. Um, but I did it in 
I didn't go to college for four straight years. I worked on the business. I went to college. What did you study? Um, I studied feminist studies. Okay. So just a solid liberal arts background. Mm-hmm. Um, I've heard that's one of the best majors to get a job. It's It was incredible. <laughs> the recruiting that came after me <laughs> <laughs> at that time around right. feminist studies, it was really right. hard for me to make choices and defend <laughs> off recruiters. So um, then there was the – so Osea was – Pretty much cons- a consistent thread. It was like simultaneous. Yeah. Where did the name come from? Um, Osea means ocean, sun, earth, and atmosphere. Mm. And oh, my like mom, an acronym. My mom created the name, and it is the four elements. I love it. Yeah. And it only took me three years to figure it out. I'm so <laughs> proud of myself, really. Did it, just, did it just come to you one day? or there was No, there like a formulation no, I process? actively worked on the name for three years. I mean, give us, I'm curious, because Pat and I have had multiple businesses that never took off, but we've had names mm-hmm. for these businesses. We've always had names, the businesses. Yeah, like. we've had names of businesses, and it takes us a very long time to come up with them. But what went into it, and why were you so, you know, Focused on actually coming up with something right and something that you believed in. Besides the obvious answers, but like, why was it so important for you to get it right? And th- you mean like three years is a long time. Well, I th- well I think interestingly in cosmetics, it's on the bottle, so the name has to actually look like a name. It, it, I mean, the visual part of the name, the auditory and the visual are so important on the name. I mean, that's what greets the customer. You know, it's not like a piece of clothing where, you know, there's the tag behind the it. tag. Be- I mean, it's staring. I mean, the it's name right is like a pair of eyeballs staring right back at you. So it had to be the right name. And I wanted it to communicate and convey things. And I wanted it I, I wanted people of multi languages to understand it and get a sense and a feeling of it. I mean, the acronym obviously only works in English, mm. but when people see it, they get a sense that it comes from the ocean. Right. You know, the, the name sea, communicates. Right. How much? How much of your parents' like uh, background? Uh, you mentioned your your mother was a uh, ad executive, and then your well, in she ad, did that only for a short period okay. of time. But my dad was a corporate executive, mm-hmm. and he was a market. He was great at marketing. And, and how much did that influence sort of what you eventually wanted to do in terms of like, did you want to uh, have you start your own business one day, or, or was that? Oh, kind I of- wanted to be an archaeologist. That was my life dream. And then I worked on a couple digs, and I realized when you're digging in the Mid East. You have to start at 4.30 in the morning because of the sun. And I am not a morning person. I mean, <laughs> and we would dig from 4.30 to 11.30 and oh, that geez. was it. And then oh. you'd sleep in your tent because the sun would be beating down in the afternoon. So mm. I had to reroute after being an archaeologist. Yeah. And I've, I've actually never worked for anybody. So... Lucky you. And I just yeah. <laughs> well, I worked for... I, as an archaeologist, I worked right. on teams for that. Right. But that's it. After I, the fact, right. Yeah. Huh. Um, so Melissa, going back to you, um, so it's kind of at that time when, you know, it's always sort of been a part of your life, but you know, you're, you're approaching the end of high school and, and you see a business opportunity here. Like what's the next step? What do you, what do you do then? Well, I think I'd love to say, I just asked my mom if I could work with her, but I think I just started saying, I'm going to do this with you. <laughs> I actually don't remember how it started. No, it it was super organic because it started, so we can scratch that part over me saying No, it. no, it's fine. Um, it was really organic. And yeah. it's, I, that's, no one's ever asked me that question. Huh. Um, I, I think it was just like bit by bit. I started seeing things that I could do. Um, I learned how to build and operate QuickBooks. And that was something like I could contribute right away to the business. I've always loved anything with technology or a program. And it really just happened. Also, the business was in our home. So it was right there. Yeah. And it was a slow start. And Mm -hmm. we really built from there. Jennifer, I know you wanted to chime in on that answer of uh, how she started getting involved. Well, actually, I'm allergic to um, spreadsheets and programs <laughs> like QuickBooks. I have this intense, you know, allergenic reaction to them. What happens? Like, you just, I, like, I just freeze up. My brain yeah, shuts I down. Know. And I, I mean, yeah. That explains me with like unintelligent people. Yeah. yeah it must be an allergic reaction. <laughs> and I oddly 
love spreadsheets in yeah. QuickBooks. It makes so, us a it's great It's a match team. made in heaven. <laughs> so when I saw that she actually had an interest in it, you know, I just gave her the opportunity to have that idea and think of that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you love it? Here you go. Congratulations. <laughs> You, get to well, do it. I mean, you might want to stop now. I'm going to question everything. <laughs> <laughs> so you obviously naturally just kind of at home. You wake up. You work on the business. It was on a kitchen table. Yeah, it so was everywhere in the were house. You guys, were you guys actually the ones developing the product? My mom was doing the products, okay. and I, we slowly started to move into our own lanes. Okay. Um, I was really focused on operations, financials, sales, marketing. We were really, and my mom was really, we, sales were a shared responsibility. Um, you guys are all just wearing many hats. I mean, every yeah. hat. But what kind of things? <laughs> I did the shipping. I mean, yeah. we that's the most amazing thing to me today about Osea is as the company continues to grow and we have more employees and a greater team and like just so much more every single yeah. thing in the company we have done at some right. point. And I'm, I'm curious. I want to kind of go deeper into that because I feel like Pat and I have sat down with 120-something episodes or 115-something and I think we always hear a very similar story. Like we did everything, like everything that you you think is like systemized now and automatic, we did, right? And I think a lot of times people that on that topic, it's funny. We had we had Johnny Ray of Howlin' Rays. If you've heard of Howlin' Rays on the podcast, and he he says like he always uh, likes to challenge um, you know the, the folks who work for him. Like if I can wrap a trash bag faster than you, like you, you got to like figure your shit out because like I did I I was doing this before I started the restaurant. So anyways, yeah, yeah. Sorry, no, but you know. I think people that want to be owners or entrepreneurs, so the entrepreneurs that we were talking about earlier, they think that it's easy or it's simple or they don't have to do the <laughs> small stuff, right? But talk to me about those days. Like, you know, obviously it wasn't fun, right? Maybe it was. Maybe you guys made it fun. Well, but a lot of parts of business aren't fun when you start up. And so what's your advice to people that are – Maybe this is all that? part of my mom's master plan and she just <laughs> – now I'm just – I question everything. Um, but – I would say we always had fun. And that is probably why we're still here 23 years later. Yeah. Because has one thing, I guess it is all coming back to my mom. She would always say, we're not solving world hunger. This isn't rocket science. Like, we didn't take anything too seriously. So, yes, we always had fun. But it was a lot of work. I mean, mm. that is... It is, it's just a lot of work. I don't know if there's any other way around describing the beginning. I, and I think that people fall under the illusion that there's some shortcuts. Right. And that, oh, if I have this brilliant idea. Well, there's a, a, a million zillion brilliant ideas. The work is really in the execution. And you just have to be relentless. And everything, even still, like most of my day is spent on doing things that are somehow going to advance the brand, advance my understanding of the space that we're in. I'm going to learn about some new ingredient or functionality or who do I connect with? Where I mean, it's just you always have to be... I always say that I, I created Osea, but I'm following the vision. I mean, you, and mm -hmm. that's what you have to do. You just have to follow the vision. No, Mom, I say that. I'm just joking. <laughs> I was like, oh, damn. She's, I've really done my job. My, like, oh, my. Oh, damn. Should we, like, walk out of here right now? Like, I, you know, like, no. I just want to clarify that I was a last-minute invite. So if suddenly you stop hearing my voice, you know what happened. <laughs> yeah, so basically, let's, let's be real. So what happened was we were going to sit down with Melissa. And then Melissa revealed to us that mom lives five doors down. And guess what we did? We said, you know what? We're going to get mom on the show as well because she was part of the founding team and, you know, had the vision. And here we are. And that's why we're here. So we're glad to have both of you again. Um, obviously, so, well, yeah. One question I'm wondering, yeah. um, kind of, I guess in those early days and even like, you know, a few years later, like, were you, were you worried um, at all, like of starting, like starting a business, like with your family, like, with your daughter, like what that would do maybe like the potential of that relationship not working, you know, eventually? I, I was actually more worried on basic survival issues okay. as to how am I going to pay the rent? Got it. How am I going to keep going? How am I going to 
cover the health insurance and the fees for soccer. And I mean, I, I had a lot of financial pressure just to keep it all going. And I learned incredible, I've gained incredible ability to budget. Or as some of my friends say, I can stretch a dollar longer than anyone else. Mm. But um, I mean, I wasn't even thinking of like, oh, what would it be like working with my daughter, how's that going to affect the relationship? I just saw it as a way, whoa, we're all in this together. We're all going to do it together. It's fun. Oh, guess what? Um, Ozzy Osbourne said on Entertainment Weekly that he loves our ocean cleansing mud, and we're going to listen to rock and roll music and ship till 3 a.m. every night for a few nights while this yeah. flood of orders would come in. So, yeah. you know, it was just... It was always an event. It was always an activity. And, I mean, there's many ways to spend time with your children, and I think working with them is really organic. We cook together. Um, I want to say, you know, my son by age nine, I mean, he could have been in the Iron Olympics. I mean, he is a killer with an iron on an ironing board. Yeah. You know, so, every, <laughs> I mean, everybody just I had to... I hope the be, IOC is listening right now. And yeah, they, I know. They, I really make hope... It a part of I mean, because really... I think that he could take the gold in ironing. And I have some, maybe he should. Does he have an ironing company? N- no, he doesn't. But he should. Yeah, I have he a lot should. Of stuff yeah. That should get well, he's just across the street, so we can get him over now. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. There we go. Literally the, is. This is like I the Palmer Square. <laughs> we really are. So I think one part of our history. So. My mom and I had this 10-year period in the beginning of the business where we grew the business. 96 to 06? Maybe like to 2009. Okay. Mm-hmm. And we grew the business organically, really with just the two of us. Um, it was just like a, a very slow organic growth. And how are you getting customers? At Word this point, mouth? we're almost all wholesale. Okay. And then at this point, I... Yeah, wholesale. So boutiques, like we launched at Fred Siegel, we're selling at spas. We really weren't doing anything direct to consumer. Right. Was only the retail model just like that was the only way that we were going to do business? It was QVC, like catalog business or stores at the time we started. There wasn't a lot of choice. Right. Or maybe like a mail order, like seen on TV. There's no e commerce, there's no social media. (laughs) No, nothing like that. So um, at that time, in like, around 2009, I had developed um, a new hobby, and which became kind of an obsessive passion, which was hula hooping. So I ended up leaving the business, not entirely, but almost entirely, to help start and create a woman's fitness brand called Hoopnautica, which was a hula hoop dance and fitness company. Wow. And I like to say that I got to go to business school, mm. um, ended up building a multi-million dollar hula hoop company, wow. which had a whole edge. It was it, one of the f- things that was so striking to me about that whole experience is it was such a different business than Osea, but it was also so similar. I, so yeah. much of it was so similar. I grew up in the, I grew up in the nineties and I remember hula hoops as a kid. So I guess this is 2009, like or it's 2009. Yeah. What, it, what was the opportunity you saw in the hula hoop space? Like what so was, it was this, it was a practice call, like really hoop dance that okay. I'd originally seen at Burning Man. Okay. And it was this like rhythmic dancing with hula hoops. It's a really incredible, beautiful movement. And I wanted to bring it to the masses. And so we created adult size fitness hoops and a whole DVD instructional series that taught mm. you how to dance with hula hoops. And um, it they were $50 hula hoops. So I really had a huge challenge in <laughs> yeah. selling that. And it was selling one thing, one time. And right. it also happened to be at the most perfect moment when Instagram was starting, when Facebook was starting. And so I got to that learn... That nostalgic factor of hula hoops everything. and all that and stuff. Yeah. The entire premise of hula hooping was once you started doing it, you wanted to share pictures of yourself with your hula hoop yeah. and a video of you doing it. So mm. it just couldn't have been more suited towards social. It would be social. perfect for TikTok right now. Too. Yeah, actually, maybe maybe hula hoops com- coming back. Might be coming so back. So I got to just... I went on a Mom, wild... watch out. She might be leaving the business again. Okay. <laughs> watch out. <laughs> it's happening again. I went on this wild ride. First announcement hoops. on the show right now. I got everything from um, selling almost a million dollars of a handmade product on Good Morning America wow. within 48 what hours. Was that? The hula hoop. Bro, you, that was handmade? 
uh, half of the got business it. was handmade and got then it, I sold it. the handmade it. where it was like, oh my God, how am I even going to manage this to like, you know, such huge highs and lows. And I really, I, that was my version of business And you were just school. doing this on your own, the Hula Hoopie? I had a business partner. We had a whole team. And so I got to like grow a business in a different way. And after How my, long was that? That was about four years. And um, my business partner was just going through a crazy divorce and we couldn't operate the business the way we wanted to. So I had this whole new skill set and thought, okay, I'm just going to maybe just spend a little time on Osea. So who was running Osea? My mom and my stepdad were just keeping the business going, growing really slowly, and we were just continuing to build this following. And so they really kept the business alive. Mm -hmm. And then I came back and was like, okay, I'm going to just try out few of these things that I've learned. I built a new website. I put the brand on social. And we... And the brand, sorry, the brand was still being sold like retail only? It was only, That's yeah, done. in retailers at that yeah. point. And, More than just and how was, I guess, how was like the, the brand doing at the time? Like, was it selling a lot? Like, was it pretty... Like, we had consistently grown 10% a year okay. for 15 years. Which just, is great. It was a really healthy business. Yeah. yeah. And, and I know... It, you guys are just so cute sitting there going. Thank you. So it was just like uh, That's the first time anybody said that on the show so No, really you're that. so <laughs> cute. I could see like the brains Thank going you. and and you're like, "Oh, so you're you just sold it like to stores and yeah. you know, to a few spas, but back then the fact that it was big, yeah. But yeah, but and I totally get where you're coming yeah, yeah, from. Yeah, yeah. No, but I, but, but we remember those days. I mean, we grew up in that era. My dad's yeah. in the jewelry business. Like it's only like it was only wholesale. Because like, like 2009 was kind yeah. of the time when like a lot of brands were moving online too. So that's how I was like, right. Yeah. But I mean, for us, we you know we were selling to Four Seasons Resorts. We mm. were at Fred Siegel. You know, and it was a slow growth, but. I always knew I was building a global brand. And even though I was sitting in my garage in mm-hmm. Malibu, I knew this was a global brand. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I, and the rest of the world wasn't quite aware of it at that point. But I, and I think that's part of when you're building a business, you just have to have this illogical, insane, irrational, possibly arrogant belief that I can do this. Mm-hmm. And, and you just never doubt You have yourself. to be a little crazy for sure. Blown yeah, I mean, like, I was actually having this conversation with somebody today. I think that there's a good crazy and bad crazy for sure. But I think the good crazies, and I think Pat and I talk about this all the time, you have to see the world before the world sees the world, right? Like, it's like you have to see what's coming in the future and what trends may be and become almost like a forecaster, right? Like, well, you, that, that's kind of my specialty. Yeah, yeah. So. so, what's coming up in the next few years? We'll talk about it offline. I don't want people to know about it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Let's, yeah, let's, we'll save that for the Founder Art exclusive. You, you don't want to wind me up on that <laughs> later. So, yeah. So, Melissa, getting back to you. So, you joined the business back in 2013-ish, right? Yeah. So, 2014, 2014 came five, back. six years ago. Yeah. Before we start, before we get to that point, um, I'm curious. Like, that's a different start of the business It's a different that brand new yeah, start. Yeah, it's a whole um, story. But when you were first starting it and, and then obviously leading into the Hulu business, like what kind of – because you mentioned, you know, um, you didn't like go to business school. You didn't study business. Um, you didn't really have a lot of outside, you know, work experience. You were kind of just kind of started this business like in high school. Um, what kind of resources like were you turning to to learn about business or even learn how to operate, whether even it was like marketing or whatever it might be? Like, did you was it all just learned by doing or so much was learned by doing? But I would I find I, I, I go everywhere for my research. I've done so many different personal development courses. I've read so many different books and audio books and mm. podcasts now exist. Mm-hmm. And I would I go anywhere for info. Yeah. Cool. Uh, yeah. I mean, we see your book, a few books here, and a lot of them are pretty, pretty big books. <laughs> Do you remember what you were consuming before you came back to Osea, Osea in 2014-ish? Yeah, I was consuming social media content. Like, like talk, talk to us about like what? I was just trying to figure out how to hack social and mm-hmm. how to make social media actually make money. Did you find... I, I wasn't looking. There was no books. There was right. nothing at the time. I was yeah. talking to people who did this. I mean, this was f- six years ago, five years ago. And what did you get from it? 
I would just go to any weird conference I could find. I mean, I I learned how to use social to grow a business. In the, we're now, I mean, in the past five years, we've become more than half a direct-to-consumer business. Mm. Um, we've grown thousands of percentages, and it is really directly tied to social. Which is incredible. Yeah. And I was just... I would just find someone who was doing something really weird. Like I met this woman who was an SEO genius and I would just follow her anywhere she went. And she taught me about affiliate marketing Mm -hmm. and SEO before it was really moving into like the mainstream. Now when you have a startup, usually you get an agency that's doing your social, that's doing your SEO. But there was these tactics that were really expensive and hard to find. So I... I just did everything. And not I to also, mention a lot of those agencies are like bullshit. Well, yeah, that's a whole other problem now. <laughs> yeah, like I mean, it's better off you do it yourself. <laughs> yeah, and that's actually long been one of my beliefs. We do everything in-house at Osea. Yeah. And I've had a lot of agencies come and pitch us, and they have a really hard time telling us what we're doing wrong because I believe at the end of the day, you care more about your business than anyone. 100%. Yeah, I mean, those guys care about the profits, and, and that, that's fine. Like, that's their business, but that's what they care about. Like, they're also managing several brands, ideally, to stay in business, so they don't have as much time invested as you. I'm sure there's certain industries where it works. Sure. But we're, we're so much more than a business. Right. This is like a passion-driven right. project. It's a lifestyle. I mean, we've been at it for so long. Yeah. I mean, you know, we inhale... OS and we exhale EA, you know, <laughs> OSEA. <laughs> and, and, and I guess in the span of, you know, the 20 some odd years, um, have you ever had to like raise outside funding for growth or anything no. like that? Or has it been purely self-sustained? Through no, the- I look at our e-commerce as our fundraising and our work is how we raise money. We make money and then we spend yeah. it and then we earn more from it. That's- it's, that's the, that's it's the a, dream. It's this whole that's idea. Dream. <laughs> it's that's just amazing. building a yeah. healthy business. Right, it's yeah. the anti we work. Yeah, um, very much so. <laughs> right, which is which is incredible because now you see all these businesses that are IPOing, and you know we th- we always talk about it, we're like where's strategic the strategic bridge rounds. Yeah, where's the profit? Yeah. Right, like how are you making actual money? Like, isn't that a business? Well, we're in business, right? So if we spend a hundred dollars, we're definitely going to be making a hundred and fifty dollars, right? At like, least. and it's probably more. Like, this is what we do. We're in business, and that is something that I'm so proud to share with our team because I've seen them come from companies that aren't like profit and revenue driven, but like that we're making a profit. We're, we're, we're growing a business and most importantly, like we're doing it in a way that is really like attached to what we believe in. Mm -hmm. And I'm just so proud that we can continue to do that every day. So with the growth of the business, like what has been, what have been, what have been some of the challenges? Like as the business grows, I'm assuming the team has to grow and all that kind of stuff. Like what are the biggest challenges you faced? Well, before we go into the challenges, because I mean, I got to say, I'm lucky. Melissa's the one that's handling most of the current challenges of the business, (laughs) which is really great. I'm so glad she came up with that idea (laughs) of her being the CEO. It was brilliant. And... um, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> for those that didn't hear melissa said that's actually rude right i'm really having a good time playing with her tonight no i really love get, this i'm know, glad this it's, happened it's a we mother's, couldn't have planned it better no it's a mother's prerogative yeah and but i think just to you go on a little bit more of what melissa was saying you know, Osea always had to be profitable. I mean, maybe it wasn't much profit. And trust me, there were many lean years, but it had to make money because it was supporting our family. Mm. And also, Melissa, I think, really understated how much, how hard, how many seminars, how many boring Wednesday nights whatever's in weekends downtown in convention centers. She has, she really has like a PhD in business. I mean, she's way beyond the MBA and she's worked so hard with coaches and you name it. She's done it. She's been there. And, and sometimes I would just say to her like, wow, how did you survive that weekend? 
And Melissa always said, you know what, Mom? I always learn one thing. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of the success in OSEA is that Melissa's worked so hard to really develop herself as a leader and all those one things. And she is a natural born marketer, just like her grandfather. Melissa, do you think she made up for that comment? I, I think I think she did. Room. I think she did. Yeah, I think she made well, it for that comment. I was mostly joking. Yeah, but no one liked your family to bring it up. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I always say if yeah. I can be really calm with my family, then yeah. it's really just a level. Yeah. A so new you're level. You're in a Zen Buddhist state. If Full. you can be totally calm with your immediate family member. <laughs> my next goal. <laughs> yeah. um, no, it's so interesting just kind of hearing like how this whole thing was born out of necessity and has, has always sort of been that, like knowing what that's like to be at a point where if I don't make money, if I, if, if the business isn't making money, like I can't pay my bills, I can't survive. So yeah. that's, and, yeah. And I'm a single mom. Right. Right. It's like kind of like the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Like forget like making, you know, a business that can buy you nice things and that kind of stuff. Like we need to pay the bills. Like that's the number one. Mm -hmm. And then, and then Melissa for you, like just kind of, um, being like kind of a sponge and absorbing all this information and, and always kind of you know, having the the eagerness to learn new things, which is so important, so important. Yeah, definitely. And 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 also to your point, is I I was we were converting one customer at a time, mm. and I as I said, I needed the business to pay our bills, so I wanted to give the customer the best possible product, so they would fall in love with the product, and I could keep moving on to the next customer. And then I would say, like, the real magic formula came with my approach, which is essentially just try everything. Mm -hmm. And marketing really is, by leaps and bounds, my number one passion. Mm -hmm. I have to extract myself right. from marketing and do other yeah. things in the business. But there are just so many strategies. Right. And my, my approach has always been customer acquisition, customer acquisition. How can we get a customer using the products? Because of what my mom said, when they do... They're our customer. Yeah. And do you have any customers that have like been customers? For, or I guess like what's like the longest customer you have? We legitimately have – I have a, a very weird memory. Um, <laughs> like a sli we oddly have – I have like a slightly yeah. – a, a very active memory for weird details, but I have customers that I personally phone sold 20 years ago so who cool. are still purchasing. Wow. And we know some of their names. <laughs> and they, wow. they still message us. But we – some of our wholesalers, we've worked with for 20 years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we've actually had different customers call up that have been buying from us 15, 20 years and say, hey, I'm a lifer. I mean, we've had more than one customer self-describe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's what's awesome about this business and just even like a family business is that even your customers feel that familial, the familial vibes, let's call it, right? Like the fact that this is something that all of you are all in on and you really care about the customers and the product and even just even the marketing, the fact that you put so much thought into it and you're still focused on doing that goes to show how much you care about servicing the customers with the best possible product. And I guess talking about products, I know when you came back, you said there was a completely new Osea. What was so different about it? You know, besides the marketing and the social media, were there new products added? What were those products? How did you really come about well, doing I that? Well, I think what's, and I've already said this, there have been a few new products, but the products have always been there. It's really just an entirely different company. Mm -hmm. um, it was just our family, and now we have a team and an office and, I mean, a rapidly expanding team, which actually does answer some of the questions around challenges, which is a personal challenge of how do I continue to be as involved with the business when it's becoming physically impossible. You know, we have over 20 on our team now. Right. It's so sort of I, transcended I, you and the yeah. family already. <laughs> and yeah. that it is a really fun challenge of like, how do we keep an environment that like really feels like a family mm -hmm. where everyone's really invested? And it's really important to us that everyone feels well at work. We're a wellness brand and that everyone's excited and like passionate about what they're doing because this is so much more right. than just a business to us. Right. And it's crazy because like I feel like in the last five to ten years and just with the rise of e-commerce, there have been so many brands in the skincare and, and cosmetic and beauty space that have like come out. But at the end of the day, that's what they are. They're they're just sort of brands. They're not 
all like they don't have this deep history, which is interesting to see like how long you guys have been doing this and 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 still being so so out there and and a big part of that space. I think it's such a winning combination of when co-founders and a team really works right yeah. because my mom and I really care about very different things. Yeah. Having her everlasting commitment to product, the customer experience of the product and the quality of the product coupled with my I would just say self competition of like how many new customers can I get how fa- how much can we grow this business how many customers can we yeah. actually show this product to those two things together have been such a, a winning formula mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know in terms of the actual product you know I, we had a lot of questions from our uh, audience as well so I'll kind of tie it into our conversation here a lot of them asked about the clean and vegan aspect of the products what does that actually mean and I mean I'm not very educated on this on this issue, but I'm very curious as to what that actually means and how you guys have kept up with that. So the vegan is really simple. That was, we didn't even highlight that as part of our brand. Originally. We've we've always been vegan. We don't need animal products to make a great cosmetic, um, to make a great skincare product. It's, it was just a natural. Um, now it's really amazing to see customer awareness and that consumers are actively seeking plant-based alternatives in terms of clean. What's so or cruelty free, right? Cruelty free. Also never, you know, we always like to say we did test them on our family dog multiple times. (laughs) He was a big user, helped his skin rashes. Um, beta tester. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> exactly, our own yeah. <laughs> running our own program. Um, but what's so funny is that clean didn't exist no. as a word ten exactly. years ago. Not when, in business, yeah. No, not in not cosmetics, anything, actually, not yeah. in beauty, not like in clean this. eating, clean this, clean that. Yeah. But that was actually our whole purpose for being. Mm. My mom had the idea to create Osea when she was looking for products that matched the standards of what she would put in her body. And she wanted to match those with what would put on her body. So that's actually something we've had to almost catch up with as a brand in the way that we speak, in the way that we the messaging. market. Yeah, because we spent so many years like underplaying things. You couldn't say, oh, this is a non-toxic product 10 years ago. Right. Because people would think we were insane to say something was toxic yeah. in the first place. Right. But then you have all these brands coming to the space. It's like, by the way, we are too. Like, we've been here for, well, and that's we've a been whole, here for you. Yeah. Yeah, that's a whole other situation because it's a rather unregulated space. Yeah. Right. The FDA is not regulating right. claims around clean and non-toxic and safe. So that's a lot of where the future of clean beauty is going of actually giving the consumer more knowledge to understand like what they're selecting. And I guess on that topic, where do you see that macro trend of quote unquote clean? Where do you see that going? Well, before I answer that, and I'm so curious because I really have a little bit of an aversion to the word clean Mm. because the opposite of clean is dirty. dirty. And, you know, that word really began with clean food. Mm -hmm. And that really didn't set well with me because I thought, well, no, if I'm starving and I need to feed my baby, I'll feed them dirty food with preservatives or whatever. Or what quote unquote dirty food. Quote unquote dirty. Mm. So I'm still wrapping my mind around the word clean the way that I perceived it was natural derived organic ingredients, you know, more just from chemistry terms, Mm -hmm. um, you know, derived from nature. So where the space is going, well, I mean, I think it's pretty obvious we're all moving in that direction, Mm -hmm. but we also have this other incredibly huge issue, which is the climate emergency. And yeah, we all want our organic lavender and we want whatever that is from the Amazon. But all of our resources, I mean, we're starting to look at certain types of crop collapses. So, you know, we're we're living in very strange, interesting, fast-moving times. Right. And I think to answer the question that, or the the topic of clean, my, my answer is that, it's more so a marketing, a branding issue, right? Like, because when people say clean, the opposite is dirty, right? Yeah. And so they want you to think that the opposite of clean is dirty. I think that that's why companies or just businesses or clean eating or clean skincare, whatever it may be, it ties it to this positive thing 
that is not dirty, right? So that's just my viewpoint. But again, like Melissa, I'm curious to hear what your answer is coming from more of a marketing branding background. Why do you think the word clean has taken such, you know, has become so big? Or it's even used. We very hesitantly used it, yeah. but it's really a nice shortcut. We don't, it's easy to describe what we do now, that it's clean beauty, but it's really not a marketing line. We've really stuck with um, the true term, which is we are a natural derived brand. Right. But like, again, everyone's using it. So the, the fact that people are going to start using it more often now, you know, it's going to, it says something about that well, industry or that trend. As I said, I try everything. Yeah. <laughs> so I do use it, yeah. Yeah. but it's really not like the pillar of our. Has it worked well? I mean, ha, ha, what, what's the feedback been? to the use of that word or just I don't find that for our customers it resonates it's actually easier for me on a business standpoint to say we're a clean beauty brand got it sums things up for the customers they really resonate much more with um, our conversation around which ingredients we're using our ingredient sourcing our commitments such as being plant-based mm. natural derived the really the cruelty-free, different claims and aspects of the brand resonate much more deeply. Got it. Uh, I do have a few more questions, actually, from our audience, which are really cool questions. Uh, one has to do with competition uh, with other companies. How do you keep a pulse on your competition, if you do? And, um, and who do you consider your competition? I'm curious, because yeah. I don't know. So I'll take this one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I... On the one hand, do not consider anyone our competition um, because we're doing something totally unique. Yeah. And also, we're competing for real estate on someone's face right. with a lot of other brands. So I see other natural brands that are act doing a great job of communicating the message I don't really see them as competition because we're a really small percentage of the beauty industry right. and we're all collaboratively working together through our own marketing campaigns to communicate like why you're making this choice. Um, some of the brands that, I mean, Beauty Counter I think has done an incredible job around this. I don't consider Beauty Counter our competitor, but technically we're selling similar products, likely to similar consumers, mm -hmm. but we're both strengthening a movement. Does that, do you even care? Because from your answer, it seems like you don't even care about competition. I, and I don't say that in a negative way. So I definitely care when I see brands copying us, mm -hmm. um, which definitely happens. Right. There yeah. are brands that have... I mean, I'm not going to name any names, but yeah. tens of millions of dollars in backing, and they will copy us word for word. Okay, so we had a little joke going in the office. There was one or two brands that, I mean, it was just so obvious. And, you know, they had all this VC money. So the joke became, like, when we'd come up with a new name or concept, well, should we just DM them, like, let them know, that, like, just save them that step of having to copy us? I mean, there was one point when one competitor, I looked on their website, and their imagery was the same thing as ours, like our weird outdoor bathtub. Yeah. Yeah. The weird. So they call a, they call that a me too. Yeah. <laughs> also, L'Oreal copied our brand product name that wasn't wow. trademarked. The exact same color and texture, and it was filled with a bunch of disgusting synthetic fillers. I feel like some of these really big brands just kind of wait, right? Like they wait for like some. Yeah. You know, I mean, someone to introduce is, something and it's like, boom, let's we'll take it. Industry is rampant with copycats. Yeah. So. Mostly, I I take it as a compliment, but once in a while, I is do. it because it's difficult to like? Um, I guess I don't know if it's the patent is the right word, but like patent a formulation. I guess so. It's not even a mu as much. There's only so many names right. for a cleanser. There's right, only, right, right. only so many concepts. Right. Um, you know, we have a lot of trademarks and a lot of intellectual property, but I'm not sure. What would you say? Sometimes it's just I, I mean. 
more than sometimes, it can be just downright copying. Sometimes it's people are in the space, they're looking at everything, and they see an idea. You know, it's like music. My husband's a songwriter, and a musician might hear something coming out of a studio, and then it mm-hmm. will go percolate in his head. He'll go into his recording studio, and then next thing you know, oh, he copied me. Yeah. You know, So there, it's part of the collective creative unconsciousness along with flat out copying, but with competition in general, all these brands in the natural derived, quote, clean beauty space, there are competition, but yet we're really all on the same team. We're pushing this movement forward. Our competition are those few large multinational (coughs) companies. That's our competition. The rest of us, we're you know, and the more that we can align and support one another, we're all just trying to pave the, into that space, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. a movement. And so I guess in any movement, in your opinion, like what what sets one brand apart from the other? Like why does one brand or how can one brand be much more successful or what are the factors that lead to that? I would say in our industry specifically, true success is driven by the quality of the product because in order to build a sustainable business, you have to have repeat customers. And the only way to have repeat customers is to over deliver on the promise of the product or a subscription, which it doesn't make sense in a lot of businesses. (laughs) Yeah. A subscription. (laughs) Yeah. We've actually been looking into adding that into the business, but our customers are on a subscription. Yeah. When they're out of their product, they're getting another bottle. Exactly. And that's really product quality. That's, yeah. that is where you win. You can have incredible acquisition strategies. You can have incredible marketing. You can have huge budgets and you can acquire a lot of customers. But in this industry, the name of the game is keeping the customer and you're only going to keep the customer and with I, the product. I, and I still think that word of mouth is a big form of that. Like, especially with women that are using product. Like, I mean, I was saying earlier, like both of our girlfriends have this product. Like they, they talk like, oh, hey, I've been using, well, see, I love it. You should check it out. And boom, the next thing you know, a couple of days after, it's in their mailbox already, right? Like, and the that's a big thing, especially word, with how connected people are these days. Word of mouth is really what has driven all of our growth. And we're so lucky that word of mouth is so amplified at this time. Right. You know, four and a half, five years ago, what really started to fuel our success was influencer marketing. Correct. And... We worked with micro-influencers because we couldn't afford anything else. And we were, at that time... And what were you giving them? Like a product and here, go post about it? Exactly. And you can, you know, and that's... Consumers can smell authenticity. And they can smell it from us, but not just that. They smell it from our influencers. You can hear it. You can see it. You can tell the difference. And that is what's going to separate. And that's what's going to shift marketing in the next coming years is that authenticity is the only thing that's right. actually going to work. And we, because we could never afford to work with beauty influencers, one of the things I started four years ago is I realized people who were into food were not being approached by beauty. So we created a heavy influencer it's like community. cross-functional. Yeah, like all that. food writers, right. vegan chefs, trainers, Love nurses. That. That. And that's... Those are, and that was word of mouth because when this nurse you follow is telling you, we have a nurse who just drives mm-hmm. so much revenue for us. When that yeah. nurse who's telling you about how to like scrubs and every different thing about being a nurse says, oh, by the way, this is the skincare that I'm using. Yeah. And you hear every couple of months, she continually talks about it. Yeah, yeah. Tell me about that. She actually topic, likes it. On the topic of conversation, like in that case, uh, sorry, uh, competition, like it's kind of like the Peter Thiel. Uh, you know, framework or whatever. If uh, it's not really his, but you know, competitions for right competitions now. for losers. It like gets in his book zero to one. Yeah. Like, why? Why compete for the real estate on one influencer that is has like thirty million brands coming at her um, to post well, in the in the space? That's been my Go, marketing strategy from 100%. day one, which is like we can never win yeah. in the big. No one, like no we'll one, will never can have win. the dollars. Yeah. We're never gonna have that. Yeah. But it's all like it's always been for me about finding like small communities right. where we can really make an impact. And I think Melissa, to the topic of influencers, like forget the fact that now it's like just extremely pricey to work with these big beauty influencers or you know fashion influencers or whatever it may be. They promote like hundreds of products on a daily, weekly basis. So number one, it's like your product gets lost in all their products that they're promoting. 
And to authenticity, you don't even know what they actually like. Like, I don't know what my influencer that I follow actually uses or actually wears or actually eats. So, you know, I know that recently you had like a celebrity endorsement or I saw, I don't know if it was recent, but from Leah Michelle. How have you guys kind of involved the celebrity into your business? So the celebrity, I think by virtue of the fact that we're in LA, has always been super organic for us. They've discovered it first in the early days. They found us at Fred Siegel. They find us at Spas. Leah Michelle just DM'd us on Instagram. Awesome. She just found the product. And this year we had like, it's my mom mentioned Ozzy Osbourne earlier, yeah. which happened maybe 15 years ago yeah. when that show was so huge. Yeah. Um, and we this year had an incredible celebrity lift through Victoria Beckham, mm. who discovered the product naturally at a She's spot. the original Posh, His by name the way. is Posh, she, so... Uh, is that the... In, yeah. Because but this I is have, very full circle. But I have... Guess who has the app Posh Instagram? You do. And he literally gets tagged in every, like... Uh, po- Wait, uh, this is very Spice full Girls. circle because... Okay, I'll just take a one-minute shout-out to Victoria Beckham. So The OG one, Posh. <laughs> the, OG, <laughs> the OG Posh. We, yeah, gotta, we, we give her posh. that. Yeah, we'll give her um, that. that. Um, our family home burned down last November yeah, in the fires in Malibu. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you're the good in the news Malibu. is my mom lives yeah. five doors away now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Brought the so, family closer. Yes, that's true. It yeah. really physically very close. Yeah. Um, so it was like just such an incredibly difficult time for us yeah. on so many levels. And Victoria Beckham made a slight mention of the product right. and she found it and then she saw that our house burned down and she made a lot more than a slight mention and sent me the kindest DMs saying, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry to hear this, and then proceeded to say sorry in the best way possible. She tagged us in stories. Mm. She multiple times talked about how much she liked this product. Not only did she post about the product, she posted the bottle when it was finished and was like, oh my gosh, I'm out. And this was a huge six ounce bottle of our body oil. She was not joking. She finished it. Um, And the lift that we saw from her it was really like such an incredible blessing in such a stressful time. So I'm a posh fan for life. Boom. You heard it here first. <laughs> She's a diehard posh, posh life, fan. Yeah. But that was really organic. Yeah, yeah, and then when she yeah. put it on her Instagram, Refinery29 picked it up mm-hmm. and did this absolutely insane feature about this is the oil Victoria Beckham is obsessed with. And then so many other people picked it up and it was on the AP and it was everywhere. Wow, and this was all from this like one really kind act it's almost as if like all the great work and the like true effort that you guys have put into this like it just was now being exposed to the world that's, that's what it ex- seems like that's exactly right because when you said like what changed in the past five years right. i just i would say i learned the tools and skills to actually show what we're doing right. to the world the product we're selling our best seller was around 20 years ago wow is i mean would you consider that like your I've made it moment. Like, was it that, or like when I say I've more so the business, like the we've made it moment, like the world now knows because your mom was just talking about earlier, like this was a global brand in her garage, but nobody knew about <laughs> she it. She knew. Yeah, yeah, but nobody <laughs> knew, right? But was the fact that now articles and celebrities and influencers and communities were picking it up, was that, and again, it might not have been, or maybe that moment for you hasn't come yet in your mind. But was that that moment okay, that we Okay, I think it? we both will have different answers yeah. on this yeah. because we both approach the business so differently. I have an I made it moment probably three days a week. My wow. I made it moment last week was I was at a dinner and I was at someone's birthday dinner and someone said, oh, I just started working for your company and I didn't know them. Like That's I did, That was like... Oh, okay. This That's that right was, on the CEO, that was and an I, I made a moment. And yeah. she was so lovely and it was great. And and that was really exciting. And then this past weekend I was at this concert and these two like nineteen year old girls. Cool concert? Uh no, it was actually the exact opposite Jonas of Jonas Brothers? No, it was an ambient music night. Oh, it was so relaxing. It's called Secular Sabbath. Big plug. Yeah. Um yeah. Yeah. And these two 19-year-old girls came up to me really cutely and said, "Um, were you the person um, on the To Be Magnetic podcast? We know who you are. And, like, freaked out. And we're like, because of this, they each had one of them started swimming in the ocean daily because of my suggestion of swimming in the ocean. And um, 
Another person came up and told me that she started paying herself in her business, which is something I'm in. If anyone ever wants to talk about that, I am such a huge fan for anyone starting anything. You have to pay yourself something. Um, And she told me that she was going to start paying herself. So, like, I just think every day to me is an I made it moment. I love that. But I'm now curious about mom's answer. You know, I think for me, it's more of a verb. I'm making it. Like, every moment, I'm God, making that's fire. it. Just, just, oh. These one-liners just... She's so good. It's like, it's not even fair anymore. <laughs> Should I go home now? Yeah, I'll see you later. <laughs> yeah, no, no. Why don't you show yourself out? <laughs> <laughs> just make your way out just like you're making it. No, I'm just kidding. So, yeah, so you... Every day for you or, is, or just the whole process of it, right? Uh, every day. I mean... Because it's it's that old expression. It's it's the journey. It's not the destination. It's the journey, and every moment in life is so precious. So yeah, I feel like I'm making it every moment. Mm-hmm. That's amazing. Wow, this has been so much fun. I mean, maybe I need to go home after that. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. I I want to let's go to. Let's go to I want to also give a little shout out to. Um, this is about. Four years ago, I was I was at an amazing event. It was called Summit at Sea, and I was is hearing this the one with Bizno? Yeah. yeah, and I was hearing all these incredible speakers in the tech space, and I was feeling a little bit overwhelmed. Like, whoa, we raised our first round, second round, and I was just like, ah, you know, where do I fit in all of this? We've raised no rounds. Yeah, and then there was a theater, and I just needed to dunk in and Martha Stewart was speaking. And it was Snoop Dogg with her? I think yeah. Probably the best friends that the two Yeah, yeah, the two best friends. And I thought, wow, Martha Stewart and Snoop Dogg. Okay, this is totally different track now. (laughs) And people were asking questions. And Martha Stewart really just had one message. She said, if you're a consumer brand, you need to make a fantastic product. That's the most important thing. So it really always comes back to the integrity of what it is you're creating and what you're presenting to the consumer. And, you know, I I love this because I think that, and I'm glad this actually really worked out because as great as it was and funny as it was and how entertaining this podcast was, I think at the end of the day, one of the biggest takeaways for me was you have two people here, one who's very product-focused and one who's very brand marketing focused. And I think, and, and not to say that you guys don't care about the other aspects, but I think that why this works out is one person has focused so much of their time on perfecting the product. And she the, literally meditates on the product yeah, yeah, every I, I, single day obvious. for three hours. And you're yeah. the one that's putting it out in the world. And I think that that's what people need. I mean, that's what companies need is you could be doing something great, but if nobody knows about it, it, it doesn't matter, right? Like, so... I think that's a big takeaway for, and I know a lot of individuals that are in this thing that like, they do a lot of great stuff, but no one knows. And I think they have this fear of w- telling people and showing people why they're doing it or what they're doing. And I guess, Melissa, I'm curious, what's your advice to people that are either starting a business or have a business on, on really exposing themselves? Like both the good, the bad, the ugly, the great stuff, what's your take on that? I think my advice is always consistently the same. It starts somewhere and you just have to keep moving. I had this really crazy breakthrough maybe four years ago. I was, I used to just obsess over our email marketing. You know, the color had to be right, the font size, the line. So I got a mailer. Like Pat. Yeah. Okay. Not so really, I, I, but... I have, I have a, I have a yeah. challenge like for you. Yeah. Start somewhere. Yeah. Do a fine mailer. Make it look nice, respectable. Yeah. Then go ahead and obsess about it for another however many hours you want to do it. And then A, B, test them. And you'll be shocked at the result. I realized like how much perfectionism was holding back, like Mm -hmm. really moving the message into the world. So my advice is always start somewhere and keep moving. Right. Because... Going, starting somewhere takes you to that next incarnation. Because so many times you just don't end up starting because you're like so yeah. overcritical of something where you're like, you just talk yourself out of it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I look back <laughs> at some of the work and some of the marketing I did and I, all I can think is, wow, that's what got me here because yeah. we were running a business. I had to make this, I had to send out a mailer to make the sales that week so we could get there. But 
it's really just a process. Yeah, and at some point, that extra time that you spend on it isn't – you can't justify it. Like you're, you're wasting time. You just put it out there, see how other people react to it because it's one perspective. Your perspective is just one perspective. It definitely has to approve – you know, you have to definitely like – like it. I'm but, not advocating to, but yeah. perfectionism can be. Uh, there's some really great aphorism about this, which I can't remember, but something along the lines of perfectionism. Perf- perfectionism is the enemy of good. Mm-hmm. And sometimes. Perfect or productivity. Per- so, yeah, yeah, something along yeah. those lines. Yeah. And that for me, as a marketer, as a CEO, as a brand builder, that is what really transformed the business. And you focus your perfectionism, perfectionism where it's the most important, mm. the product. And you know what? And you just do your best all around it. Well, Jennifer, Melissa, this has been an incredible conversation. Uh, we had a lot of fun. I so can, much I'll, fun. I'll speak for myself, but so I think I had fun. a lot of fun. Yeah, well. no, I can tell you had a lot um, of fun. Too. <laughs> yeah. And I hope that uh, you guys also took something away from this and, uh, and to the listeners um, you know, number one, family businesses can work. You know, as you can see, they still like each other. Um, so much so that she walked five doors and joined the podcast. And jumped uh, in last jumped minute. In last on call, on a podcast. On call. Uh, but also that you could build some great things by just doing it and moving forward. So thank you ladies both so much for being on the show and hopefully we can stay in touch and uh, continue this friendship beyond just this podcast. I would love that. It's This was so fun and now we know where to find you at Posh. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Thank you. Thank you.